All right. So first of all, again, apologies for the delay to everybody that uh, joined on time. It's a, it's a pleasure, Barry, to see you again. Um, Thank you. I feel the same. I will uh, briefly introduce you and then make a small introduction. Uh, so first of all, we have today uh, Barry Kerzin. Thank you for accepting the invitation, Barry, who is an American physician, academic, and a Buddhist monk. If I'm not mistaken, you were born and raised in California. Hollywood. Hollywood. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Barry has uh, lived, uh, I, I don't know how, if you were on and off in Dharam Sala since uh, 1988. That's my home since 1988, correct. That is your home since 1988. Uh, serves uh, and is serving as a personal uh, physician to the 14th Dalai Lama, has studied uh, Buddhism with uh, senior Tibetan scholars, uh, is the founder of the Altruism in Medicine Institute, whose mission is to increase compassion and resilience among healthcare professionals and their patients. Uh, he authored uh, Nagarjuna's Wisdom, a practitioner's guide to the middle way that introduces the reader to the basis of, of uh, Matyamaka or middle way thought. Uh, and Barry holds affiliations at the University of Hong Kong, at the University of Pittsburgh, and to the University of Washington. Um, so thank you, Barry, for joining us. Let me briefly introduce Carlo, who is a theoretical, a theoretical physicist known for his work in quantum gravity and has also several contributions <clears throat> to the history and philosophy of science. Uh, he has, is the author of uh, several um, papers, technical literature, but also has penned some uh, very well received uh, books, even some bestsellers in science popularization, and holds affiliations at the Ex Marseille University, the Perimeter Institute in Canada, and the Western University in Canada. Uh, Carlo is now living. Uh, mainly in Canada and partly in Marseille. And about myself, my name is Marius. I'm a researcher in quantum physics and gravitational physics. As a disclaimer, I did my PhD studies under the supervision of Carlo. So I know Carlo very well. Um, and I worked in China and Hong Kong and now at uh, Vienna at the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information. So first of all, thank you for joining us. Um, all right, so first, uh, let me get up to speed the audience on what this discussion is about. What we would like to do is focus on the question, what is real? Of course, this is a vast topic and everybody would have an opinion on this, I imagine. So I would like to uh, specify this uh, a bit more. We would uh, like to see whether we can explore um, if uh, the understanding of how to answer this question, what is real as seen from the Buddhist philosophy point of view, uh, could be pertinent or useful for the metaphysical analysis of modern physics and perhaps even uh, vice versa. There is only so much that we could uncover in one hour. So I expect we will create more questions than answers, but that would already be very good. Um, one word of caution on what this discussion is not for the audience. It's not a, a lecture on quantum mechanics or a lecture on Buddhist philosophy. We have two uh, personalities from two different backgrounds and uh, we hope there's gonna be an interesting discussion. Um, so after this introduction, which is turning out to not be too short, I will hurry up. Um, we will have a discussion with Barry and Carlo. We shouldn't go on for more than an hour. And then we will take uh, some questions. Please write questions in the questions and answers uh, feature of Zoom. Andrea Di Biagio will choose some. We will not be able to take all of them. Uh, probably just a few. Please keep them to the point, uh, what is real and uh, short and concise. All right, so let me first say how, why we're here. 
um, and first point out that Barry and Carla have never met before. This is the first time you will discuss. I met uh, Barry at uh, Hong Kong, at Lama Island. It was a chance uh, um, uh, meeting because uh, we were having both breakfast at uh, the Green Cottage uh, with a view of the sea at uh, Lama Island. It's a very tranquil island next to Hong Kong. Uh, Barry was discussing with Yorgos uh, uh, Kalkias, which I then became friends with, a professor or a Tibetologist. Um, he's uh, associate professor of Buddhist studies at the University of Hong Kong. And because he's Greek, I just uh, could tell that he's, uh, uh, he's Greek from his accent. I started discussing with him and, and we went uh, on for two hours with Barry and Yor was discussing uh, about quantum physics and Buddhism. So a couple of years later, pandemic intervening, I met uh, Carlo at another island, Lama Island, this summer, where uh, we're having dinner and the discussion turned again to, um, to Buddhist philosophy and quantum physics, where I mentioned that uh, I met uh, Bari and uh, Carlo was very uh, keen to discuss with Bari. So uh, what are the points I wanted to make here? First of all, we came to Bari. And thank you very much for being here to discuss with us. Second point, this is all Carlos' fault, if anything goes wrong. <laughs> and the third point is that the onus is on us to start the discussion. Um, so, Carlo, this is the final introductory point. I want to share a story about you, and then uh, I give it uh, to you. So, uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, the first... Uh, uh, how to say, course I took with Carlo, I guess, uh, was even before I started my PhD when he was teaching uh, history and philosophy of physics, uh, first year for students. And he was going on about the Greeks and the ancient Greeks and how that is super important for uh, modern physics. Uh, a few years later, I think it was about 2015, I was at your place to talk about a paper on black holes, I think. Uh, and you were super excited about this Eastern philosopher. And uh, you were just tweeting about Nagarjuna. Um, I remember how you were saying that uh, you've been reading about the ancient Greeks of this time and you didn't know that this guy existed. And if you had known, you would have started from there. Um, and I asked you, okay, if it's so exciting, you've written books about the Greeks, about Anaximander, why don't you write something? about Nagarjuna and you were like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to be received. Because he's not the Western philosopher. You say about the Greeks, everybody's like, yes, the Greeks. But if you say about the West, Eastern philosopher, they're like, well, is that related at all to Western science? So to start the discussion, I would like to ask you, Carlo, how did you come to be interested in a philosopher that is of profound influence in the Buddhist tradition? Okay, um, <laughs> thank you, Marius. Thank you for this introduction. Thank you, Barry. Uh, yeah, I remember that, uh, that moment in which, I, uh, uh, in, in which you were at my house and I talk about Nagarjuna. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, I, I didn't search for it, actually. Uh, I didn't know anything about Nagarjuna. And uh, um, I know very little about Buddhism and Buddhist philosophy, so I am, uh, Barry, I'm here without any pretension <laughs> of saying anything uh, uh, beyond extremely superficial uh, about Buddhism. I apologize for that. I, 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 in fact, I, I look forward to, 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 uh, to getting from you um, uh, ideas and, and take away some of my uh, superficiality. Um, I, I have a lot of Buddhist friends because my Catholic friends back in Italy, many have converted, have changed into Buddhism somehow. And you know, I, I, I read about main Buddhist idea, but I, I knew little about uh, uh, Nagarjuna in particular. In fact, I didn't even know uh, that his book existed. Um, but I worked on quantum theory, on the foundation of quantum theory, and uh, I have been fascinated by a particular way of viewing quantum theory, which is called the relation interpretation of quantum theory, in which um, 
one of the central thing, one of the central ideas uh, is that objects, uh, systems, things, whatever, by themselves uh, do not have properties. And in some sense, do not exist by themselves. They only exist because they interact with something else. Uh, and uh, this is a, it, it's an idea which is not completely absent in, uh, in, uh, in, in Western philosophy, but it's not easy to frame in philosophical uh, Idea, Western ideas. And I've been um, writing and talking about uh, um, relational quantum mechanics, the relation of interpretation of quantum mechanics. And so many times after a talk, people will come to me and say, have you read Nagarjuna? And I said, no, and I am not particularly excited about uh, attempts to mix, uh, you know, modern physics uh, with Eastern idea, because uh, things I've read about that, I always found very superficial, superficial way of putting both. But after, you know, the 20th time I heard, have you read Nagarjuna? I think, well, maybe I should read Nagarjuna. So I read that book in the translation by Garfield, and it was a shock for me. It's an incredible book. It's, a, it's just a fantastic book. So it really blew away my mind. And I spent a, one, a, a, a summer uh, immersed in that book, trying to read everything I could get in the garden, you know, and thinking about that. And I ended up with two ideas, um, which I just want to put on the table and to, to discuss. Uh, one smaller, one larger. One smaller is that in the garden, you know, there are some basic ideas which are helpful. Uh, to make sense of qu about quantum mechanics. Not, not because Nagarjuna knew anything about quantum physics, of course he didn't. Uh, but I think that to do science, we need, uh, we need ideas and philosophy is very useful. And uh, uh, we get from philosophy, uh, conceptual structure, way of thinking uh, that are, are usual to make sense of, 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 of better ways of understanding about the world. And, 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 <clears throat> and what is useful in Nagarjuna is the idea of uh, what is do for quantum physics is the idea that uh, it's, e it's better to think of the world, not as uh, entities or a substance or, a, or, or things or God or whatever matter uh, that has its own properties, but only um, through the interdependence of, of, of things. So you don't understand anything by itself if not connected to the others. That's, uh, in fact, it's even more. I think what Nagarjuna shows that uh, uh, if you think that there are relations between things, that things affect one another, that's the only way of thinking. So the idea of a, uh, of a thing by itself, of uh, things existing uh, uh, independently of anything else, uh, of, of, of a fundamental reality, um, it's, uh, it's not useful. And it's, I think the Gargi would argue is contradictory. That's a, that's a specific idea. This, the bigger idea, which I, I found uh, wonderful and that it completely captured me, is that uh, this is a, a, for me, fascinating philosophical perspective uh, because it starts from the idea of separating uh, sort of a conventional reality and, 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 and an ultimate, ultimate reality, uh, which is very common uh, in, in a very common perspective also in science and in Western philosophy. Um, you can also read some of the, the evolution of science or Western philosophy trying to search for this ultimate reality. Is that matter? Is that God? Is that spirit? Is that the mind? Is that language? Is that the hermeneutic circles? Is that phenomenology or the who said whatever you want? And Nagarjuna, the book of Nagarjuna is not a positive construction, it's a negative destruction. Every chapter takes away something. Look, this by itself doesn't stay together. This does, that doesn't stay together. It takes away, it takes away, it takes away. And so the suggestion here is that maybe the question is wrong. Um, we should look for the ultimate reality. The ultimate reality doesn't exist in a sense. It's the same thing as a, as a conventional uh, reality. That I found fantastic. It's a, it's a dissolving, um, it's dissolving a fake problem in a sense uh, and opening up a sudden, uh, uh, coherence, Nagarjuna, as I read it, and with all my superficiality, is not denying reality. Reality is here. I mean, this pen is this pen. It, 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 it denies the fact that this is an ultimate reality in this pen or in something on which this pen is based, including the mind, which is, uh, uh, there's a superficial Buddhism 
view of beauty is in the West, uh, which is just everything is the mind, the mind is a, it, everything is, is a, everything is the self and everything, uh, you know. Um, but you were born in Hollywood. So the illusory aspect of the walls, I wonder if you got it from Buddhism or from Hollywood, I don't know. But there's this uh, idea that, uh, you know, the, the, the wall is a big cinema and everything is, is in the mind of Berkeley. And uh, this is a, there's a mm. this chapter in, 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 in Nagarjuna which denies that completely because the mind itself is not, um, is not um, doesn't have an ultimate reality. So you cannot found anything, anything on the mind, nor on the Dharma, nor on, the, uh, on anything. Up to the point, and then I conclude, so my, my, the reason of my fascination, throwing my fascination from Nagarjuna on the table, in this passage about the view, this, uh, this comments, the, the emptiness of emptiness, uh, which was the real moment in which Nagarjuna captured, uh, captured me. So uh, it's a point in which uh, you know, translated the way I read it, or probably superficially, is that all right? So everything is empty in the sense of doesn't, not having an intrinsic reality. So therefore, this emptiness is the foundation of everything. And the Gandhian starts to towards, no, 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 wait. This is, <laughs> this is, a, this is a view uh, which, you, which is itself empty in the sense that uh, it, it depends on else. Um, this is suddenly extremely liberating, I think. Uh, and I found it, uh, it had an impact on me intellectually. Suddenly, I have a, I have a way to take, take away from my intellectual search and anguish of finding the foundations uh, uh, which I found liberating. And even personally, I mean, I was thinking about myself not as an entity, uh, but as a combination of other things, uh, has definitely an effect on me on a, uh, on a, uh, on a human being. And uh, so I guess what, what finally fascinated me in Agarjuna is this anti-foundational aspect is taking away the starting point um it's absolute radicality uh when he says that uh, nirvana and samsara themselves are um sort of uh, uh, illusory in some sense uh, empty in, in his own sense uh devoid of intrinsic reality um so here i am um i use uh, this some of the ideas I got from that book for responding about issues about quantum mechanics, when people tell me, come on, Carlo, you think about quantum mechanics systems, uh, how they affect one another, but the two systems should exist by themselves. This should exist by itself. It's an independent thing. This should be an independent thing. Otherwise, how could they affect one another? And Nagarjuna answer to that. And I, second point, I, I am fascinated by the overall uh, anti-foundationalism of Nagarjuna, which I found it extremely liberating. So that's my Nagarjuna <laughs> and Barry, apologies if I took something which of course is far more important for you than me and misread it or misinterpreted it. Well, first, let me say I'm very honored to be with you, Carlo, and also Mario, Marios, and to be, you know, uh, kind of somehow tangentially connected with the uh, IQO, QI and the University of Vienna. And now I understand in Canada, et cetera. It, it's a great honor for me to, to be with you. I remember very clearly our breakfast or our brunch, uh, Marios, that we had uh, on Lam Island several years ago in, in Hong Kong um, with uh, Georgios, with Professor Hokios. Uh, it, it was a wonderful time. And you mentioned that we had two hours together. Um, for me, the time went like that. I had no idea how long we were together. I know it wasn't a short time, but the time just went like that. It was a very beautiful confluence of people and ideas and, and enthusiasm and openness. Um, and it stuck with me. So several years later, when you came back at the suggestion of Carlo to have this, this trilogue, uh, you know, I was very excited and, and very happy to participate. Uh, Carlo, you paint beautiful canvas with many beautiful colors and different size brush strokes. Um, I would say that your understanding is not so superficial. Um, I would also say that I'm no expert. I'm a beginner, you know, uh, but I've been trying. I've been working at this for decades, quite a few decades now. Um, and you, you, you've said things that I think would resonate with me as being pretty correct. Um, you know, I didn't see any glaring, you know, areas that I could challenge you on, um, you know, with my sort of beginning understanding of, all, of Madhyamaka and Nagarjuna. 
Um, I would like to add a, a context here. So Nagarjuna is, um, he's, 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 he's presenting from the point of view of the Buddha. Now the Buddha lived about 600 years, we don't know exactly, but before Nagarjuna. And when he was about, when he was 35, he became enlightened until his passing at 81, he taught. So there are many, many teachings and we have, you know, this hundred or so volumes of the classic texts, which are this long and that thick, you know, and you turn them like this, they're written in, in Sanskrit and Pali uh, that record uh, sometime after the Buddha passed his teachings. And so Nagarjuna is really codifying or kind of trying to, you know, maybe synthesize the teachings of the Buddha and particularly the Prajaparamita, the teachings uh, to do having to do with wisdom. Although Nagarjuna also talks about the, the uh, compassion side, the bodhicitta, the universal compassion, um, though not uh, so much in the book that you were referring to, um, the Mula Madhyamaka Karika. Within that larger scope, um, we, we often talk about enlightenment. We give an analogy or an illustration of a great soaring bird. And in order to keep aloft, the bird has two wings and those are likened to wisdom and compassion. So the reason to understand and put into practice Nagarjuna's wisdom of emptiness is really uh, all about compassion because it's a way that we can be more useful to others in terms of bringing happiness uh, and eliminating suffering. Uh, so I think we have to see things in that larger context. You talked about the two truths, which is uh, something very important uh, in Buddhism taught by the Buddha. And of course, in other traditions also talking about wisdom. And that's real crucial. You also talked about, you, you alluded to the four philosophic schools um, of, we say of Tibetan Buddhism, but really this is more Mahayana Buddhism. So Mahayana Buddhism is the type of Buddhism that's practiced looking at the teachings of the Buddha that were recorded in the Sanskrit language and were given by the Buddha in Sanskrit, as opposed to those teachings that were given and recorded in the more common language, Sanskrit was more for the scholars, uh, in the common language was Pali uh, for, the, for the general public. And those uh, teachings of the Buddha are the ones that are used or primarily focused upon in the, in the Theravadan schools, uh, which uh, exist in the more Southern Asian countries, um, you know, particularly Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka. Um, the Northern Mahayana schools are in the northern countries like China, Tibet, Mongolia, Japan, uh, Korea, countries like that. Now, they're all teachings of the Buddha, but there are slightly different emphases. So the emphasis from the Mahayana school is the compassion. There's compassion in both, but there's an emphasis of this bodhicitta, literally uh, the, the awakened mind. Um, and so mind, we roughly understand, though we don't really, but we have a rough idea. And awakening is kind of the analogy is with waking up from a dream uh, in sleep. Um, and then, you know, you take the dream to be so real while you're sleeping and dreaming. And as you wake up, as you're going through that little process of waking up, you're remembering, you may be remembering the image, for example, of a dear friend in the dream. And you're feeling this closeness, this love for that dear friend. And as you wake up, you begin to realize, wait a minute, there was no real friend there. That was just a dream. And then that feeling of, you know, that closeness and that love begins to kind of dissipate, recognizing that it wasn't real. It was only a dream. So this is the analogy that sometimes used for awakening. So the mind of awakening bodhicitta is the universal compassion. No one is excluded. No living being is excluded. It involves two parts. One is the compassion and the other is the wisdom. So right away, you can see that wisdom is a subset or is, is very much influencing and informing our compassion or deepening our compassion. 
So along those lines, let me say a few words about compassion. Um, from a Buddhist perspective, particularly Mahayana, but a Buddhist perspective, it's the wish and the action when we can do something to eliminate suffering. So then that begs the issue of what's suffering. And again, these are English translation of Sanskrit and Pali. And those languages came and grew up, you know, uh, with Buddhism, Eastern philosophy and Buddhism. English grew up with Christianity or Judeo-Christian traditions. So the words we use in, in English have very different connotations, uh, but we, you know, not speaking uh, or understanding Sanskrit and, and Tibetan, then we turn to English. And now the translations and translators are quite good, um, but still it's, there's that dis, uh, there's that um, area that it doesn't quite match. So compassion or karuna in, in Sanskrit or ningje in uh, Tibetan uh, really uh, <clears throat> is looking at, you know, getting rid of suffering for everyone, including ourselves. And so suffering now as taught by the Buddha and accepted by Nagarjuna has three levels. The obvious is physical and, and, and mental pain. The next little less obvious is change, okay? Um, you know, I had a piece of chocolate cake. I just love this, best piece of chocolate cake I've ever had. So I go up to the, uh, the waiter and I say, please, I, I want another piece of that chocolate cake. And he says, sorry, sir, it's all finished, you know? So the suffering of change or loss when we lose a loved one. Um, sometimes that change can turn into the opposite. So for example, let's say the waiter said, yes, here's another piece of chocolate cake. Here's a third and a fourth. You enjoy it thoroughly. And then you wake up at three in the morning with indigestion, okay? <laughs> and then the deepest level is what's maybe more relevant for our discussion. We call, it the, we call it all pervasive. It's a conditioned kind of suffering and it's conditioned by ignorance. The ignorance that does not understand reality correctly, okay? And that's really what we're, that's the opposite of what we're talking about. When we talk about, you know, shunyata or emptiness, uh, this ignorance is 100, 180 degrees opposite. Um, so, and that last level of suffering is really the underpinnings of all the other sufferings, okay? So if we can address and remove that level of ignorance, then all the other sufferings fall away. And you could also see it as all of our attachments that get us into trouble, our aversions that can end in <clears throat> anger, hatred, and now we see so much violence in the world, you know, all that, and, and, and our selfishness and our greed, and you know, on and on, all that just falls away when we begin to get rid of this ignorance and we begin to not only intellectually understand emptiness, but we put it into our lives. It, it percolates down and it starts to be part of our attitude, the way we think, the way we feel. It, it permeates every aspect of our sleep and wake life. And when that happens, it's, it's like a revolution. I don't speak from personal experience because I don't have that. But according to the great saints and masters who have, it's like a total revolution. It's full of joy. It's complete love and compassion. There's no moment where there isn't. And it's always bathed in this wisdom of emptiness, taking things, as you said so beautifully in the beginning of your remarks, Carlo, that everything is um, in relation. There are no discrete entities at all. There's no independent existence. I think those are the words that were used by um, David Bohm, who was a very close friend of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's, and uh, as you know, a, qu a well-recognized quantum physicist. Um, so those are just some contextual opening remarks to put us in the, in the, in the right ball field, if you will, uh, as, as a, with an American background, baseball field, right? Could be a soccer field. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much both. Um, yeah, Carlo, please. Um, thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, I, this is, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, this is useful to, for me enormously, um, both in terms of context, uh, but also in the most positive way. Um, I take this as a criticism uh, uh, in, 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 in a positive way, which I'm, which I'm happy with. Uh, let me translate uh, 
what you said into a criticism. It's like uh, you were saying, look, Carlo, uh, fine, you're finding Nagajuna something interesting, but you missed the, the, uh, 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 the, um, some uh, more valuable aspect of what is around there, because the, uh, the, the wisdom is uh, makes sense uh, together with the compassion. Um, and this, of course, is, um, uh, is a, uh, it's a fault which is common uh, in me and in a lot of uh, intellectual tradition, which I accept, <laughs> I see. Uh, and I, uh, I, 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 I take it. And um, um, I think that indirectly, uh, what, what you said did had, uh, I mean, I didn't entirely uh, ignore that in the sense that, uh, as, I, as I write in the, in, in the chapter which I wrote about Nagarjuna uh, in my book on quantum mechanics, uh, um, first I go into the strictly uh, use of, 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 of uh, Nagarjuna uh, or Buddhist inter interdependence uh, ideas uh, as intellectually relevant for uh, a, a sort of a, a useful philosophical background for understanding quantum phenomena, so getting rid of a notion of a, um, of, of a fundamental stuff, a fundamental reality on which to anchor everything. Uh, second, I, I, uh, I talk about the, the fascination for me of this large, uh, strictly philosophical perspective about what's out there, what is real. But then at the end of the chapter I said, and by the way, this, um, uh, this is talking to me at a at a more uh, 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 large level or more personal level, uh, because it does change my 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 sense of being in the world. And uh, one way in which it does is, uh, um, is 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 precisely because it it it, uh, uh, it changes my understanding of myself of the self and 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 the relational aspect between. What I am and, and, and the rest of the world, and what I am and, and, and the other uh, beings, uh, living beings, or sentient beings around, uh, around me. Somehow, um, uh, it, it, it suddenly uh, 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 takes away a, a little bit of the um, anguish that change, impermanence uh, 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 causes or produces uh, by, um, by uh, making me think that uh, uh, there is no permanent me uh, who is uh, 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 th uh, threatened by the impermanence. Um, and it, uh, it, it pushes uh, myself at interpreting myself as, as, as a part of a network in which I am um, I, I'm produced by the interaction with the others. And it resonates with my uh, larger uh, uh, pre-existing Western uh, uh, political uh, ideas that any uh, interpretation of our uh, human and social life in terms of uh, uh, you know, competition and uh, maximizing our own good um, of the good of our own nation or the good of our own people um, against the other, uh, it's badly misleading for ourselves and for, for, for everybody at, at for a number of uh, uh, for a number of levels. So there is an interdependence uh, of, of the reading of, of uh, 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 social and human relations, which goes together with this deep inter dependent it's separated but it's a, a it's a, it's a, it, it resonates I want to say that because I want to say I'm not that totally deaf to <laughs> the compassion side and the larger side of the story but I'm but I am I am what I am with my uh, limits and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, you know you're, you're you're a medical doctor no right you cure the body also not just uh, focus on that and I am um, I'm a, a you know Western intellectual working on, on physics and on fundamental physics so in this context this beautiful context that is a large picture that you have given what has fascinating me on the Gajuna is the specific uh, 
um, and, and this book, because this book is uh, uh, what surprised me about this book, uh, this particular book. I, 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 I read the others also, some of the others also, um, the letter. Uh, but this book is a lot, uh, somehow the Gajuna here uh, seems to be um, uh, closer to me in the sense of focusing on, uh, it's only in the last part of the book that he sort of opened up the, the, uh, the, 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 the topic of the discussion to a more, how would I say, eschatological uh, 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 discourse. For, for, for the majority of the book is specific about, uh, um, I guess, what you call the wisdom uh, size and is specific about uh, um, what uh, what what are the the way really that is what are the the main uh, concepts that we use to to understand the world and he shows that these concepts uh, uh, don't hold in some sense because it's all a, a negative right Kajuna, uh, the verses of the this book here it's a <clears throat> it's a collection of chapters I, I suppose for the many people in the audience who have not read it. Who don't know about it. It's a, it's a short book, uh, it's a collateral shaft, in which um, it, it works on, on, on logic essentially, and, and shows look if you <clears throat> if you take this entity as existent, you get into a contradiction for this and this re reason, and it slowly demolishes all the possible foundations of our uh, thinking. Uh, not only object, but also causation itself, also time itself, also the self itself, and so on and so forth, one, one by one, um, showing that uh, thinking that they are foundational, they, are, they, are, they, they have intrinsic existence, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't hold. So this is a, a, if I get it right in your, in your, uh, in your large pictures, this is a wisdom part of the story, which as you say, makes sense because uh, because of the larger story, uh, but this is the part which has fascinated me. <laughs> this is the part that has captured. Uh, we are we all limited, and we look at one one detail at a time. Um, uh, I I have uh, look. Um, I have. Uh, I think that uh, I don't know how to put it. Um, did, yeah, let me put it one thing. Do you think that uh, uh, it's there's anything wrong? Let's put it bluntly this way. In uh, in in uh, in uh, in trying to take that from the Gajana and and uh, letting the thing, letting this uh, bit of wisdom, small bit of wisdom that I can get out of it, uh, influence the rest. Uh, but uh, using it directly, because I think that that's my, that's what I think is my contribution. So now, uh, look, there is in this, uh, in this large uh, aspect of good philosophy, there is a, there's a part of it, which is definitely very relevant uh, for modern physics, because it could be used for it, and, um, uh, and for modern philosophy. And, and you know, there, there are people in modern philosophy, there are people in Cambridge, there are people in, in the US, um, uh, not only Garfield, but Westerfeld and others who, who, who are using uh, uh, idea uh, from the Gaudiana in, in a philosophical context. I, I think there's this dialogue, and I don't know if I don't know if anything could be useful in the other direction in a sense. But it's a you know I think culture is a dialogue. It's a dialogue in which, uh, in which uh, uh, we, we keep learning from, from else, whether it's a, a tradition, whether it's a different school, whether it's nature itself, because we interact, whether it's us talking to one another. It's this constant exchange that, in my opinion, makes the beauty of, uh, of, of, uh, of culture, but also, uh, but also the, that's how we learn, that's how we know, that's how we change. And in a sense, once again, um, all this is, uh, it, it's relational. It's, uh, it, it, it's how we influence one another. Well, uh, first, let me say that, um, you know, I think it's very beautiful, the, um, 
discoveries that you've made, the journey that you've made, you know, the courage to do that as a quantum physicist, you know, being suggested by some of your students or at least colleagues or audience people when you give talks uh, to read Nagarjuna that you actually did and that you actually went into it and you actually spent time with it. You've thought a lot about this. And, and, and as I said before, I think your understanding, you know, at the level that we're talking, um, not that I understand it much more, but the level that we're talking, I think is very clear and very excellent. And the fact that it's had some impact on your life, uh, you said less angst, uh, you can see yourself much more relational in relationship to others and events, etc. cetera. Um, and that changes something inside of you in a positive way. I mean, this is beautiful. And, and, and I would encourage you, of course, to continue with that. Um, uh, you're quite unique. There are maybe a few quantum physicists, physicists that have interest, and if, you know, but few that I think have really read Nagarjuna, particularly from the beginning to the end of his uh, you know, Opus Magnus, his, his, his major treatise of the six. We have all of those actually translated into English. And you know, some of them will deal more with the compassion side also. Um, so I, I applaud you for that. And I, I, I feel very, very happy and in a way connected with you, partly because of that and partly because we're connected now having this lovely conversation. Um, allow me for a moment to dive in a little bit. Um, you, you've made many points here and let, let me sort of uh, dive in on a few that, that I wanted to make comments on. Um, so the first, um, and so that I won't forget, the next one is going to be the four philosophic schools. I mentioned that you also touched on that. Let's, let's flesh that out a little bit. But before we do that, let me um, talk about something that's even more fundamental um, and helps us to understand the progression of thinking through those four schools to the, what's usually considered the most sophisticated, the Madhyamaka school. Um, and, and that is the distinction, which is really important between existence and intrinsic existence and the, exi and the distinction between uh, no existence and no intrinsic existence. So this is th these distinctions, um, if one doesn't fully comprehend the, the Madhyamaka system, uh, not fully comprehend, but have some idea of the, of the uh, Madhyamaka system, one then usually make, is not able to make these distinctions. So let's talk about them for a moment. Um, so existence, um, we, when we talk about existence, uh, we talk about our ordinary understanding of what's real, okay? That things are objects. Uh, things are, you know, they may be in relationship, but what's in relationship are two different distinct objects or entities that are in relationship. And that's kind of our normal understanding of, of existence. So lacking inherent existence or intrinsic existence begs the issue to understand what is intrinsic existence, okay? And that's the uh, object of negation for the Buddha, for Nagarjuna, and for all those following in this tradition of Nagarjuna, the, uh, the Madhyamaka school. Um, and so, that's not so easy to wrap our heads around uh, what is intrinsic existence. In a way, it's so close that we miss it. You know, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, staying in a, in, a, in a new hotel room in a new city, waking up and looking for your glasses and you can't find them and then realizing that they're already on your face. Um, and so intrinsic existence is things existing independently things existing uh, through relationship, um, things, uh, not, not things existing dependently, not in, independently. Um, and so if we look at dependence now, we can look at that at several levels. And the more obvious level is, you've mentioned that, Carlo, is cause and effect, causality, okay? But there are also more uh, subtle levels of dependence that the Buddha and Nagarjuna uh, talk about and are really central to the philosophy. So the second level is the relationship between whole and parts and parts to whole. It goes both ways. Okay. That's a, a, a little bit, you know, a, another level, if you will, of, of dependence. 
uh, in the, particularly you know, highlighted by Nagarjuna. And then the third level, which is the most uh, subtle level, the subtlest level, which is really what we have to start to understand because the opposite of that is this independent or intrinsic existence, okay? So this third level we call dependence through designation or sometimes called dependent designation, but it's dependence through designation. It's a type of naming or labeling. So for example, Barry, we label or name Barry. My parents gave this name to Barry based on a body, okay? Maybe a little tiny infant body at that time, right? And also uh, in terms of maybe some kind of behaviors or you know how they thought this emotional structure is for this little baby, right? He's very calm or he's very, you know, he acts out a lot, he's very active or, you know, all those things. So upon all that, a name is placed, in this case, Barry, okay? Um, so that relationship of, you know, dependence through designation is really what Nagarjuna is talking about when we talk about dependence. Um, and so that's very uh, important to understand. So the opposite of that, coming back to understanding this inherent or intrinsic existence. There are many words in English we use synonymous for rangshing kimepa, not existing intrinsically or inherently or independently or from its own side. Those are all synonyms um, to the Tibetan uh, terminology that I just mentioned. Um, so when people don't have a good appreciation for intrinsic existence. And you say then, so the second, there were two comparisons. The second comparison is uh, non-existence and not inherently existent. So when, 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 when Nagarjuna says no inherent existence, what often people interpret is no existence at all. And they fall into a, a nihilism that nothing exists at all. So they haven't fully under appreciated this notion of um, intrinsic existence. So they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? When we're throwing out or negating uh, intrinsic existence, th they don't quite understand what that fully means. They think it's all of existence and therefore they you know, think that nothing exists. They throw the baby out with the bathwater. So that's- Can, those I, are can, I, can yes, I interject please. something before you go please. ahead? You, you, you promised us the four, uh, <laughs> the four schools, the four, uh, but but can I can I make a comment here? Um, of course, of course. About it to say, because that, this, is a, this is free flow. So yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Please, please. So we, you know, we gave the title. Uh, what is real to this? Uh, uh, to this, and I, I, that seems to me, um, that's exact that distinction that that you you made between existence and uh, intrinsic existence. Um, inherent existence is a it, it's a, 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 it, it's a, it, it's the idea that that I found central and and and, it, and centrally central useful for me for for the following reason first of all um, I mean the notion of reality the notion of existence here are close I mean what what exists is what is real what is that um, and uh, let let me articulate in, in a, I want to say a couple of things one is that um, we make a distinction between illusory and real in our everyday life, uh, which it's well founded. I mean, if I if I see the chair and there is a mirror there, and I see a chair sort of the other side of the mirror, there's a precise sense in which the chair in which is the other side of the mirror is not real, while this chair is real. Um, this distinction has a meaning. Because I can sit on that chair, I can touch that one, but I cannot sit on that and touch that one. But then we realize that some aspects of uh, what is illusory in the chair in the mirror also are shared by the chair, which I just called real, which is also illusory in some other sense. Um, for instance, uh, the fact of being a chair, uh, it's... Uh, no. Cut out and back on, so I missed you up until now. Please, could you repeat it? Oh, uh, from where? From where? Where did you miss me? <laughs> uh, when you were saying this distinction between 
existence and inherent existence and non-existence and non-inherent existence is very helpful. Uh, and then oh, <clears throat> after that, yeah. I lost you. Yeah, I wanted to um, make a couple of points. One is that uh, we use a distinction between illusory and real in, a, in everyday life. For instance, we yes, say that, that um, a chair that which I, I sit is, here, yeah. yeah, a chair I which I sit is, yeah. is, is uh, it's, uh, it's not, it's real while the chair in the mirror is, is illusory. But then I was saying, of course, then um, through science, uh, we realize that there are illusory aspects uh, in the chair, which I just called real as well. But then one is tempted, and that's um, to say, all right, so there are many illusory aspects of that chair, but there is a, a, a more fundamental level in which uh, there is a description of what is going on there, which is a real one. And Eddington uh, made it very, very vividly in a, a well-known uh, distinction between the scientific table and the everyday table, uh, when he says, look, I have two images, there are two tables there. There's a table on which I eat, uh, which is solid. And then there's a table which I view with my scientific eyes, which is made by atoms uh, uh, and is not solid. There's a lot of emptiness, uh, of, of, of not emptiness in the gadget sense, empty in a completely different sense. I, I, um, I've heard that uh, that emptiness is 99.9 .9 to the 12th power <laughs> empty right. space in the atom. Is that <laughs> right? Yes, yes. But that's, of course, not Nagarjuna emptiness. That's just no. the lack of presence of atoms. Yeah. Um, and Edino says, uh, and, and people use that in a, uh, by saying the, 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 the chair of my, uh, the chair in which I sit, the solid chair is illusory, the real chair is the atoms. Uh, this way of using the notion of real and the notion of, uh, um, of uh, uh, existence, so what exists is the atoms, uh, is dangerously misleading. That's what I, uh, because uh, it, uh, um, it, it pushes us to try to resolve the relational and illusory aspect of reality that we see in terms of some uh, basic fundamental physical reality from which to derive it. Mm -hmm. Or uh, in Western uh, subjective idealism, in terms, and, and it's derivation, in terms of some uh, sort of uh, uh, fundamental mind or fundamental subject, uh, which is a real existing entity, uh, the Cartesian mind that is certain of existing itself, um, or the Kantian subject, or even uh, the, the, the fundamentality of the perception itself in Husserl uh, in, and in uh, phenomenology. So there is this, um, Western need to anchor um, the, uh, what we mean by real or something final. So uh, to, to, to realize that there is dependence, but then there is some basic grounds on which everything builds up, on which to, uh, on which to sit. And uh, uh, this is what I take emptiness, uh, the notion of emptiness, the Gajuna notion of emptiness to be useful. Uh, to, to get rid of this urge of finding beyond the, uh, the illusory aspect of the world, uh, a, uh, a, a basic level which is not um, uh, real in, 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 the, uh, in the sense of, uh, uh, of uh, um, in which this chair is, is real compared to the, uh, to, to the chair uh, in the mirror, but, but really the fundamental way. So the, 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 the bottom line of the story, the, the, the solid terrain on which to anchor, the ultimate, uh, um, uh, 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 the end point of the line of dependence. The line of dependence ends to some point, that's what is real. And, uh, and what it is Nagarjuna is that that's a wrong question. I mean, uh, it's not only that the chair, the table is empty because I can uh, understand it's something else, but it's also that something else is also empty because I can understand it's something else uh, until the point in which there is this uh, emptiness itself. It's, uh, it's empty because we shouldn't take it as a, as a fundamental sort of metaphysical principle on which to ground all the rest. So, yeah. this, so putting this, this is, a, yeah, I just want to put this in slightly different, per, 
terminology, emptiness is what allows functionality. Emptiness is the lack of any kind of essence, even on a you know atomic level. And I agree right. with you what you said. That's I think very true. Um, right. When and this is an look at the chair, when we look at the chair versus the reflection of the chair in the mirror, that gets a little more complicated, because both of them, of course, lack any independent existence. Both, okay, they're both empty, uh, in terms of shunyata. Um, having said that, the metaphor that the Buddha used, he gave about ten different metaphors uh, for you know something to be illusory, and one of the important ones that he used was reflection. You know, he used the reflection of the moon or the full moon in the in the still water. <clears throat> that it looks like the moon, but in fact, of course, it's not. It's a reflection. Um, he used such things as water of a mirage, sound of an echo, and you know things like that um, it, to illustrate. Okay, now um, let me mention two experiments, if I may, and you correct me where I'm wrong. I'm a pop physicist from the New York Times, okay? <laughs> um, and one is the, uh, the thought experiment of Ed, Edwin Schrodinger, okay? The so-called Schrodinger cat paradox or thought experiment. And you have double steel box in which you have a cat. There's no doors, no windows, right? And you have a, a vial of very uh, powerful acid that's connected to a radioisotope. The half-life of the isotope is the same duration as the duration of your experiment, your thought experiment. So the chance of the cat, uh, so if the radioactive uh, material uh, decays, 50% chance, it you know somehow pulls a lever and the acid spills, killing the cat. If that radioisotope does not decay, there's no spillage of the of the uh, of the acid, and the cat remains alive. So quantum physicists call this superposition where the cat is both uh, alive and dead. Uh, when you crack open this steel box, then uh, uh, you observe what's inside. And then the cat is either dead if the radio isotope you know, decayed and knocked over the acid, or it's alive, it, it didn't, okay? And it's, it's either or, whereas when you can't observe it, it's both, it's superposition. Okay. Second is the double slit. You know, you you shoot these electrons or photons, you know, through two slits in a metal thing, and then you have a screen behind and you look at the, the pattern. And if you have a little camera or an observation device at the slit, the level of the slits observing, you find a pattern below on the back on the screen that suggests what passed through the splits were particles. Whereas if you remove the observation device, you have an interference pattern suggesting what went through the slits or waves, okay? So these two experiments, at least in my very, uh, you know, superficial understanding, tell us that observer dependence is very important in terms of reality, okay? That whether or not there is or isn't, or, or maybe you can, what type of observer, you know, presence there is, very much influences and determines what's real. And so that then, uh, jumps into the four, you know, Buddhist schools of philosophy. Uh, and the, if we go from the so-called least sophisticated up, the third one would be the one you alluded to. That's somewhat similar to Bishop Barclay in the West and other idealists that say that everything is consciousness, everything is mind. And things that seem to be solid out there in an external reality are nothing more than projections of our mind. And that's actually a very sophisticated philosophy. It's a very sophisticated philosophy. One of the things it starts to do is it breaks down this notion of a solid external reality, okay? But its, con its, uh, its critique, as you, have, you also mentioned, is that it takes the mind, you know, to be somehow, you know, uh, absolute or ultimate, you know, existing. Uh, and so then the highest, if you will, most sophisticated school of Madhyamaka says, well, what the Chittimatras, the mind-only school says, that's correct up to a point, but the criticism is there's no uh, you know, absoluteness about the mind either. So then you end up with that you accept an external reality, you accept a mind, but both, you know, that is every existing thing uh, exists without having any 
exist in relationship without having any, any independence or uh, objectivity. Um, and so that's very roughly the, at least the, the, the last two of the three Buddhist schools. The third one is divided again into Prasangika Madhyamaka and Svatrantika Madhyamaka, uh, using Tibetan terms that are borrowing from the Sanskrit. Um, and the Prasangika Madhyamaka is considered the most sophisticated, where nothing at all has intrinsic existence. The, whereas the uh, Svatrantika Madhyamaka, they say that some uh, uh, conventional reality does exist uh, from its own side, having some essence. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of a distinction and a debate there. Um, so just wanted to, to mention those things. I, I'd like you to comment, if you would, on some of the quantum physics, um, you know, and, and bring that in as we come to the and near the end of our hour, you know, transition to our to our questions. And you please allow me. I'm almost out of battery, so I'm going to have to move my computer oh. and get plugged in. And I'll be listening to you intently, I promise. Okay, do you want me to talk or to wait? Yeah, please. No, go ahead. I'm listening. Okay, good. So, um, first of all, let me comment on your quantum physics. I have only one objection. Please. I think it's, uh, uh, it's what you said about the two uh, sort of prototypical uh, quantum puzzles, which is Schrodinger cat at the double slit experiment. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's perfect. Um, my only objection is that in my book, I describe, uh, of course, I have a chapter about Schrodinger cat, but I don't use uh, a situation in which the cat is dead or alive. I prefer a situation in which the cat is asleep or awake, just because I don't like killing cats, even in, in, uh, <laughs> in, uh, in, in mental experiments. So up to that, uh, uh, replacing a sleep cat with a dead cat, I think uh, I, 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 I completely agree. And uh, let me come to the, the serious part of the answer. Um, what you mentioned as the passage from uh, the third and the fourth um, between uh, um, among the, the, the sort of the versions, the, uh, um, of, uh, uh, of Buddhist philosophy, it's uh, it's exactly what I what I think is relevant for quantum mechanics for this for the following reason: we read in quantum mechanics books that um, we should not think about the mechanical description of reality, but the description of reality with respect to the observer. And there is always this notion in in books that there is observer or the apparatus that measures. So it's a uh, uh, but I am a scientist which view the world from the perspective of uh, modern mm -hmm. science, where one way of viewing the world is that uh, uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, billions and billions of galaxies, each one with billions and billions of, uh, of, 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 uh, of stars, so probably with planets all around. And uh, um, from that perspective, the observer in any quantum mechanical experiment is just one piece in the big story. So I have found uh, the uh, uh, Berkeley subjective idealism uh, uh, profoundly unconvincing from the point of view of a scientist, uh, because it, it, uh, there is an aspect of naturalism which uh, it's uh, uh, in which I, 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 I grow up as a scientist, uh, which refuses to say that to understand quantum mechanics, we have to bring in our mind. Quantum mechanics is not something that has directly to do with our mind, has not something directly to do about any observer, any apparatus, because we use quantum mechanics for describing uh, what happened inside the sun, uh, the, 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 the reaction, the nuclear reaction there, or galaxy formations. So I think quantum mechanics in a way, I think quantum mechanics is experiments about, not about psychology, not about uh, um, uh, uh, our mind, not about consciousness, not about anything like that. Um, it has to do about the world. Um, it, my question, what do we mean by real world? That's fine because science repeatedly was forced to change its own ideas about the, the real world. So if uh, uh, 
if to make sense of quantum mechanics, I have to think that the cat is uh, awake or asleep only when a conscious observer, a mind, interacts with this. Uh, I say no, that's not. There are uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics that go in that direction. They require am I not, either. Am I, am I correct to say the Copenhagen School does? Copenhagen School. Uh, talk about the observer without saying who is, what is observed. But uh, the Copenhagen School, which is the way most textbooks are written, uh, describe any quantum mechanical situation in terms, okay, there is an observer making a measurement and we're talking about the outcome of the measurements. So uh, yes, it's, uh, it, it, it assumes an observer, but it's very vague about what, what an observer is. Some more sharp interpretation, like cubism, uh, take this notion of observer to be very fundamental. It's an agent, somebody who makes, who thinks about and can compute the future. So it's a, it's a, that's that's a starting point for for doing uh, for doing the rest. I was I've always been unhappy with that because things happen on the sun when there is nobody that has, is an observer in anything, and I want to think to have a way of thinking in the world that things happen there independently of me, so to say. It's, they might depend on one another, but wh why should they depend on me? And who am I? Or, you know, what, uh, an observer should be a, you know, a white Western scientist with a PhD, or I mean, should we include women? Should we include people without PhD? Should we include cats? Is a cat an observer? Should we include a fly? I mean, it's just not something I understand. So these are, go these, are also, these are also cultural differences, Carlo, because in the Western cultures, generally, it's the individual. In Eastern cultures, generally, it's the group. And no one wants to, at least traditionally, step out or seen separate from the group. And so the identity of an observer from a Western perspective would more be an individual person, whereas from a, you know, an Eastern perspective, it would really be a group. Um, and so there are some cultural distinctions here also. I just wanted to interject that. Uh, could I comment okay, at good. this point, uh, Carlo? I would like to insist a bit on this because I'm, I'm not quite clear on whether you are agreeing or not on the question well, of the mind. Um, well, let me, let me, let me get yeah. uh, Thank you. This uh, is also, I, I wanted to ask him the same question, Mario. <laughs> uh, so, Mario, phrase the question specifically. All right. So, let me, okay, since we're talking about Nagarjuna now. I would also like to uh, read the, the, some simple verses that he has and uh, get from both from Barry and you, what do you think? So this is from chapter three, examination of the senses. Uh, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and mind are the six sense faculties. Their spheres are the visible objects, etc. Like the seen, the heard, the smelt, the tasted, and the touched, the hear, sound, etc and consciousness should be understood. So actually I'm confused from both of you. First of all, Bari, um, is the mind anything special in Buddhist philosophy or is it just like seeing and hearing? And uh, Carlo, are you saying there is anything special about the can mind? I, can I, I mean, I, I want Same to give Barry, Barry, Barry answer in detail, but let me, let me just uh, 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 answer shortly first and, 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 and because that's exactly where I was going in, in, in the previous thing I wanted to say. There's a crucial distinction between what Barry called three and four. That's what uh, captured me. So if we take the mind as fundamental, as existing, the only existing thing where, where the, the movie of the world is reflected into, I am not happy. My, my culture uh, rejects that as a useless point of view to do science. That's what. But there is an alternative, much more interesting, and I find much more deep, in which, which I read in Agarjuna, which is what uh, Barry seems to me is calling the fourth alternative, in which the mind is not the fundamental thing in which everything is, 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 is reflected. It's just one part of this. Uh, 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 interdependence. Now, namely, it's not the things have not intrinsic existence, but mind has int intrinsic existence. That's not the, 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 the there's, there's a more interesting answer, namely that mind itself has no intrinsic uh, 
uh, existence. Uh, and so it's just, uh, uh, it, it has an existence, but is, is, is it, of course it's, it's an existence. My mind exists, I, mean, I exist. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, 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 and if I think in terms of groups, it's the same. I mean, all sentient beings or all human beings, whatever, um, uh, together, uh, which is an idea also in some, 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 some Western philosophy that, you know, um, it, it's collectively that we, through language and that we create a vision of the world. But I want to think of this as one aspect of the ensemble of things, which is existence where uh, uh, nothing of that has um, uh, has intrinsic existence. So I want to think my, my mind is my brain, my sensation, my, all my, 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 my love, people loving me, the, the, the image that people have of me, my, my, my set of, the set of processes uh, 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 which are part of the world. And it seems to me that the Gaudian allows me to think at me as part of the world at the same sense, in, at the same ground uh, as the world being reflected in my consciousness uh, without having to choose uh, one of the two perspectives to be the true one, the intrinsic uh, um, existence. Uh, all, all perspective are, uh, are, are empty. They're all good, but they are, um, they are not the, the one on which the rest is ground. They, each of one, I can understand dependently of something else. So Marios, you read a, a a verse or two from the third chapter of Nagarjuna. And uh, let me comment on that, please. And the question you were asking was, what is mind or consciousness? So here we're using the words uh, synonymously. Um, and from a Buddhist perspective, uh, there are six what we call primary minds, and then there's a whole slew of secondary minds. And some of the more common systems include 51 uh, in the secondary minds. Um, now, please understand that mind, like everything else that exists in the world, uh, doesn't exist permanently. It exists, I mean, there are a few exceptions, okay, but essentially everything that exists in the world um, is not permanent. Therefore, it's changing moment to moment. Therefore, everything exists as a continuum, including mind. So that means there'll be a moment of mind followed by a next moment of mind, etc. Um, and the next moment of mind is determined primarily, but not solely, by the previous moment of mind. So from that, we can extrapolate a continuum, an infinite continuum. And mind is an infinite continuum from perspective of Buddhism. And that means that we've had, that implies, suggests rebirth, and it suggests we've had, we've had infinite rebirths. There's been no beginning. And so this then comes up again with the notion of a beginning creator, if you will, a so-called, you know, God, uh, there are some, uh, some problems here to resolve this. Um, and so mind is a continuum, it's infinite. Now, each moment of mind is made up of a primary mind and a constellation of secondary minds. These six primary or the five, as you read from Nagarjuna, the five sensory minds of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, tactile, right? These five plus what's sometimes called the mental consciousness. And that has le different levels of subtlety. On the grossest level is thinking. If we go a little bit deeper, uh, a little bit more subtle, a little subtler, uh, we have dream mind, which seems like these senses are active, but actually when we're sleeping, the senses are inactive. So it's just something coming from our sixth or mental consciousness. It seems like the senses are active in dream mind. That dream mind is a little more subtle than awake mind, awake thinking mind. And then if we go more subtle, we're talking now again about awake mind, we, we talk about intuition. When we're in intuition, we're not thinking, right? It's a non-conceptual mind uh, in that sense. Uh, and deeper yet, our minds we call non-conceptual and non-dual, where there's no awareness of a subject or an object. So subject, object, non-duality. So that's kind of the rough sort of, you know, lay of the land of what, you know, Buddhism thinks about mind. Now, each of those moments, let's say, for example, I'm talking. So my primary mind now is going to be an auditory mind, okay? Uh, and then there's going to be a whole constellation of next secondary ones, which are basically positive and negative or harmful, uh, positive, non-harmful and harmful uh, 
qualities or attributes or emotions or thoughts or attitudes. And then the next moment, I'm looking at my screen. So I have a visual mind and the constellation will change, you know, some of those positive and negative qualities. Like I'm feeling a little sleepy or I'm very alert uh, or I'm feeling jealous or uh, I'm feeling very happy <clears throat> and connected, you know, with this conversation. Those would be part of the secondary minds. And then, you know, you have this infinite continuum. Everyone, every living being, every, as you rightfully said, sentient being, so living being with a mind, Carlo, um, has um, its own mental continuum. Um, so it involves, it's, it's a big picture of mind. It involves, you know, our, our, our thinking, it involves our intellect, it involves our heart, feelings, emotions, uh, and it involves those deeper levels in that sixth primary mind, mental consciousness, such as intuition and deeper minds. Now, when we die, we go through eight stages, according to the Buddhist understanding. And each of those stages, uh, the first four, the elements, the sort of solidity, if you will. I, we know they're not solid, but from a conventional perspective, the solidity elements, the liquidity elements, the thermodynamic elements, the movement, the, the kinetic elements, those all dissolve as we die in the first four. And when that fourth one happens, there's no more circulation of blood or of air. So we don't breathe. We have no circulatory, you know, blood pressure. So we're declared clinically dead. But there's four more stages we go through. And those are when the mind becomes successively subtler. And those are when we get into the non-dual minds that are the most subtle minds. And the last eighth stage, it's called Wuser from in Tibetan. And we translate that as luminosity or clear light. It's not light, it's not, you know, but it's the most utter clear, clear mind. And that mind, if it goes on, if we don't die, if we meditate on that luminosity and sustain it through our meditation, infinitely, we become a Buddha. And that's why the Buddha is sometimes called a Buddha, uh, an enlightened Buddha is a deathless state uh, because you don't actually die. Uh, so those would be the non-conceptual and non-dual minds. And just for completeness, uh, those last four minds are called, and these are technical terms, so it won't make much, in, it won't have much, give you much understanding. White appearance, red increase, black near attainment, and then this wuss air, this luminosity. Um, so that's uh, kind of the, the, the roadmap, if you will, for, for mind. And it's not the brain. Now on the gross level of thinking and our sensory minds, there's a very close connection with you know, meant with the brain, okay? Uh, but when you die, the brain is supposed to be dead and you're still alive, okay? And so these more subtle minds uh, are not related actually to the brain. Uh, so we could really say that mind is experience, it's awareness, uh, it's knowing, not knowing something, but the act of knowing. So the qualities of mind, the, the most important qualities are awareness and clarity. So that gives you just some rough idea of the Buddhist understanding of mind or consciousness. I see. Um, yeah, Carla, would you like to comment? I was going to ask about uh, time and the experience of time, if you would like to go to that. <laughs> yeah. I can comment one thing about this, um, what Barry said about mind, which is not, uh, um, is, is not something I've studied. Uh, which uh, does resonate to me uh, very, um, very strongly and very interesting, and that's uh, and I found very interesting. And then I go to time because uh, it is very much related. Um, when you ask, when Mario, you ask, you ask Perry, so what is mind? Uh, I, I, I was particularly struck by the fact that Perry didn't say the mind is this, this, and that. Okay, Perry said well, the mind is many things. Uh, look, there's this and this and this and this and this, and there's a sort of layers also, in some sense, in which we can talk about it or, or, or have some understanding, partial maybe understanding about it or some wisdom about it. And this layering, I find it, it's uh, uh, absolutely brilliant from my perspective uh, because uh, it, uh, it, it dissolves the the wrong question, which is what is the mind period? 
what is the thing which is mine? Here is the thing which is mine. Uh, let's just define it, characterize it, and understand what it is. Uh, that's a wrong. That's a wrong way of thinking about it. It's, it's when we say, when we think about our mind. Of course, we think something you you unite somehow. It's, it's, a set of processes that happen into me and it's, it's about my thinking, my emotions. But it's not one thing. It's a complicated layer. There's a po many layers of discussion possible of that. that. I don't want to enter into the specific, uh, but I found this fascinating. And let me go to time immediately because uh, it's, it's, it's deeply related. I, I wrote a book on time, which is uh, um, uh, The Audio of Time, in which well, this, I- this Carlo, this Carlo is very timely because we're also kind of running low on time. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and, and, and in the book, I sort of uh, uh, try to uh, collect everything we have learned about time from science, from special relativity, from generative statistical mechanics, from other pieces, and, and, and what we tentatively uh, learn about time with quantum gravity, which is my uh, specific field. Once again, you have to sort of uh, uh, put your hands on the notion of time. And the main message of the book, in fact, the single message of the book, is that the question of what is time is a wrong question. Because when we think about time, we think about a single thing, okay? We think we have a totally clear idea about time. Time is a single thing that flows from the past to the future, and the past influence the present, the present to the future. In the present, this is how things are. Reality is the present, the entire universe is a real state in there. And we learn from science that this way of viewing time is just wrong. It's factually wrong, okay? It's not true that uh, we all proceed in, 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 in a, uh, together from moment A to moment B and the amount, lapse, amount of time lapsed between A and B is the same for everybody and so on and so forth. Because we learned that from, from experiences, special relativity, general relativity, statistical mechanics, and, and, and other things. So the way to think about time is that it's a very layered thing but with this thing we call time is made by layers um, con conceptually. And when we look at larger domain that the one of our usual experience, some layers are lost. So uh, some aspects, some, some, some properties of what we call time are only good, uh, are only appropriate for describing the temporal experience we have if we don't move too fast, if we don't look too, uh, uh, too, 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 too far away, if you don't look at the atoms too, too in detail at the single degrees of freedom and so on and so forth. So, so the notion of time opens up in a, in a, in, in a set of layers uh, which are become increasingly uh, general only if you go down to the, to, to the bottom level. Um, some aspect of time, like the universality of time, uh, 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 only makes sense if, if, we, if we don't go to fast velocities, for instance. Um, so this is a similarity, and that's why the, the, the opening up of what the mind is into layers uh, seems to be uh, the right direction to go, right? When, if, if I ask, uh, does a cat have a mind or does a fly have a mind? It seems to me that the only answer is uh, to get out of the idea that the answer is either yes or no. I mean, I, I suppose that a, uh, certainly a cat has a certain, you know, uh, sleepy feeling in the morning and the moment of joy when he sees his fellow cats. Uh, but I suppose a cat doesn't go through a complicated intellectual game of trying to understand what is reality and, and debating about that. So there is some aspect in common to other, uh, other not, we can break up this, uh, um, this notion in, uh, uh, in pieces. And once again, uh, I mean, the, the topic is what is real. Uh, if we start by saying time is real, it's a beautiful chapter of Nagarjuna, why you cannot say that time is an intrinsic existence, uh, we just get it wrong. If we think, well, then atoms are real or the mind is real, all, all these answers, we got it wrong. And the, uh, we can say that things are real in, in, a, uh, in, in a conventional sense, within a context, within a, within a um, uh, and, and, and then we when we try to realize what we mean by uh, something is real, this is certainly real in a conventional sense, uh, but we realize that uh, um, 
reality, the reality of this object itself, uh, it gets uh, uh, sort of broken up into interdependence between this object and else, uh, and its different layers. Uh, and, and that's the reality that as a scientist, I can deal with, not the ultimate reality. The, the conventional reality. Of course, conventional reality is real. As uh, Barry was saying, this is not a negation of reality. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it, it, it's a freedom from the idea of the ultimate reality, uh, the ultimate uh, uh, sort of in, in intrinsic inherent reality being there on which, on, in terms of which building and the rest. May I say a few words about time and I'll keep it brief because I see we have a lot of people in the, the chat who have questions. It would be nice to turn to them. Let me make a few comments, if I may, about time from Nagarjuna's perspective. There is no time. I don't think I can be more brief. And how does he support that? He says, well, when you're in the present moment, uh, there's no past and there's no future. If you dissect the present moment, even to a more granular present moment, some of that's going to be past, some of that's going to be yet to come, and then you have even a finer, more granular present moment. If you keep going on with that granularity, you end up having no time. You have no past, no future, and no present. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, some of the arguments or logic that Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna uses to establish no time. Now, of course, what he means is there's no absolute time. There's no time on a, some, there's no essence of time. Um, there is, you know, time from the perspective of, of, uh, of conventionality. Um, cause and effect is reciprocal. So when we have a cause, we have an effect, or we know there's going to be an effect. But also from the point of view of the effect, the result, we know that there must have been a cause. So this reciprocality is something unique to the highest school of Prasangika Madhyamaka uh, within the fourth highest school of Madhyamaka. I just wanted to mention that to, to, to round out one of our previous discussions. And it would be wonderful if we can to turn to some of the questions. Yes, that we'll we will. Um, thank you very much, Barry. Uh, we'll now turn to the questions, but I wanted one quick comment. Uh, now that we're on time, on the discreteness of time, because I am a bit confused about this. You talked both about a continuum. You were talking about the mind, of course, um, that exists in moments. You're talking about the continuum and infinite continuum, but at the same time about some sort of steps, which is what we would say discreteness in physics. And I'm just curious, what is the, um, how is time, although it does not exist uh, ultimately, imagined in uh, uh, Buddhist philosophy. So you're very uh, astute, Marios. My description of time comes from the Abhidharma literature and the philosophic school would be probably one of the two lower ones, not the mind only or the Madhyamaka, yeah? Um, so you have to understand that, number one. Number two, the understanding of time as I presented it from the logic used by Nagarjuna is from the highest school, okay? Um, so from, you know, he is negating uh, so much of what we take to be absolutely real, and we take time to be absolutely real. However we carve it up, and whatever descriptors or properties we use for it, we take it automatically to be something that has an essence. And Nagarjuna is using the logic I mentioned, no past, no future, only the present. You get finer and finer with your present, and you have no present anymore either. So therefore, no past. So th that's what he's doing here. He's trying to negate, showing the contradiction between uh, in understanding time to have some essence. OK, thank you very much. So this reminds me a bit of the talks in your group, uh, Carlo. I had prepared like uh, six pages of questions and comments in case you get stuck. Uh, and the discussion is not going anywhere. And it's been one and a half hour. And it's... <laughs> Um, so that is very nice. Thank you very much. Let's go to the um, second part. Um, I, I didn't stop you because this is exactly what we wanted to do, right? It just happened. 
Um, I would like to take a couple of questions from a few specific people first. Uh, please, let's keep, uh, keep it quick. Um, let's start with uh, Yorgos. If he's still here, yes. Uh, Yorgos, can you hear us? No. Yes, he should now. I think you will have to unmute. Yes, hi. hi. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you see me? Um, it's so nice. Hi, Barry. Hi, Mario. Hi, Carlo. Uh, it's so nice to, to be with you. Let me, um, let me just, oh, there I am. I can see myself, so maybe you can see me as well. Yes, we can see you. So yeah. let me remind you, I started the story. I met Barry with Yorgos at Lama. Uh, Yorgos is a, um, is a Tibetologist, specifically an assistant professor of philosophy of, uh, excuse me, no, I got it wrong. This is Amit. I'm sorry, Yorgos. <laughs> Tibetologist at the Hong Kong University. Yeah, that's that's fine. Thank you very much, Mario. And thank you for uh, having this very interesting talk. I mean, you, all, you covered such... Uh, profound topics and I think of course the time is very limited. Um, I don't really have any, um, I have more, I just wanted to summarize some things that you've said and I wanted to start first with the with the notion of course that uh, that Barry mentioned about the Madhyamika school of course that the Sanginga Madhyamika becoming the dominant, uh, you know, the most important superior philosophical view in Tibet of course, we must bear in mind that that was a later development that early on in Tibet, we have with uh, such figures, Indian figures as Santaraksita, uh, an attempt to combine Yogacara and Madhyamika, a synthesis between the two schools, which as Barry said, they're very profound. I mean, I think Yogacara, um, I'll come back to this because it, it really relates to the notion of consciousness and the importance of consciousness in this discussion about what is real. Um, I think it's, it's, it's not something we can get rid of. It's not something we can say it's not primary to our discussion or it doesn't play an important role. So eventually, of course, uh, the evolution is that um, the Prasangya Madhyamika school by most uh, Tibetan schools is considered the highest view. And of course, Nagarjuna is the exponent of that uh, position. Now, I think we must bear in mind that any, any sort of verbalization about reality um, is dependent on consciousness. It's not possible to have a discussion about what is real and not have consciousness in the discussion, uh, especially when we are to verbalize it. I mean, of course, any reality that is independent of consciousness, is not dependent on consciousness, is beyond verbalization. And I think the Buddhist position is very clear on that. And I think Nagarjuna, if I read him correctly, is very clear that the, when it comes to the ultimate reality, to, um, it's something that actually we cannot talk about. And basically all discussion, all discourse is very much uh, within the level of conventional, the conventional real. Uh, so this is a very interesting, I think, um, a point that I wanted to make that I think I can also raise it as a, a point for the two of you to respond uh, from your respective uh, perspectives. Um, because if, if consciousness, from my understanding, is primary to this discussion of what is real, uh, and if consciousness does not inherently exist, right? Well, at least, I mean, Barry also talked about the different kinds of minds. Um, then how does all this discussion about what is real, what kind of claims can we ultimately make about what is reality? Now, I think I have a feeling that Carlos comes from a different perspective than Barry in answering that question. So I'd like to really point to this question about, can we make any claims about reality? And if so, based on what? From your respective disciplines. 
So that's my um, my question and comments yeah, to you. Yeah. Um, who would like to go first? Hello, if you want to, um, please. <laughs> let me put this way. I, I don't buy the argument. Um, I don't buy the argument. Uh, we cannot have a discussion about reality unless it's, it, it, it's, it, it's uh, a discussion is consciousness involved. But all the discussions that I didn't know about reality, um, as far as I know, happened um, through sounds or writing in which atoms were moving. So we cannot have a discussion without atoms, right? Um, and so on. I could, I could, so then atoms are fundamental? No. Uh, the, the fact that something is, it, it, it's part of our discussing about this doesn't mean that uh, it's primary with respect to the rest. I, I think we have to take this, that's my, that's my own personal um, view of that. So, of course, we talk about uh, from say from within our consciousness, of course, and of course we have information about reality from within our senses, and of course we talk, we talk in English, we talk in Tibetan, we talk in Pali, but that's not because English, Tibetan, and Pali or consciousness of atoms are a necessary starting point for understanding the rest. I think it's uh, that's exactly the, uh, the that's the the uh, what I read in Nagarjuna's. Uh, a, a chapter about the self. Um, it's a, we recognize its dependence uh, of of I, I, I would I, I would say levels of the pieces of the story one respect to the other one, and uh, uh, but also at, at a clear at, at a clear logical analysis. This is what Nagarjuna does. Uh, None of this stands up as primary with respect to the other. That's my reading. Uh, Professor Hawk, yes, uh, George Jost, my dear friend and colleague. Um, I agree with you. When we talk about reality, we are, we are talking not about reality. Uh, we're talking about reality. It's not reality. It's because language, words, all that is, and that is not the reality of the uh, of uh, Nagarjuna. Nevertheless, it's very useful because without this conventional reality of words and concepts that are correct in understanding Nagarjuna, without that, it's very difficult for us to have that experience, that non-conceptual experience of reality. So you know, there's a kind of a metaphor that's used: is you you know you take a boat and you cross the river and then uh, you leave the boat. Or the other analogy is you, you're out in the forest and it gets cold and you take two sticks and you rub them together and with a friction, you get fire and the fire then burns the sticks. So the sticks are conceptuality as was the boat that got you across the river. Uh, not any conceptuality, but very clear understanding of Nagarjuna and of course the Buddha uh, 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 his discussion on, on the Buddhist wisdom. Thank you. Um, I would like to bring one more question to discussion. First of all, the reason I, I confuse your affiliation is because you're both at the University of Hong Kong. So let me correct uh, Georgios. He's a scholar of Tibetan and Himalayan studies, comparative religions in Buddhism, associate professor of Buddhist studies at the University of Hong Kong. And we also have Amit uh, Shadrveli that I would like, uh, if you have a comment or a question, uh, who is an assistant professor of Buddhist philosophy at uh, the University of Hong Kong. And incidentally, also a resident of Lama Island. And um, yes, that's right. Uh, so actually, <laughs> I, at the moment, I'm in Vienna and I was uh, only coincidentally uh, this, found that uh, Marios has relocated here. As there's well. too many coincidences. We're, we're all very entangled. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> So uh, I have a question, um, perhaps Carlo, you can speak to this. Uh, I, I wonder what you think about um, this aspect of Madhyamaka philosophy that I've found uh, difficult to take on board in my own, uh, to accept. And so I can grant so that particles in the sun are not ultimately real. They don't have intrinsic existence. 
in that somehow they depend on each other for their existence. They're all, um, you know, in wh whichever way you break that down in contemporary quantum physics. There, there's no intrinsic, there's no, they're all um, ontologically causally dependent upon each other. Um, so in certain, in the uh, quote unquote lower, lower schools of uh, Indian Buddhism that Barry alluded to, uh, the ones that still maintain some belief in uh, Sobhava or intrinsic nature, they too will think that yes, everything is causally dependent because everything is dependently originated so that uh, you have these momentary um, entities. So a, a fire atom, or if not even an atom, but a, a quality of heat arises from a previous quality of heat or whatever. You have these momentary entities flitting in and out of existence, uh, but they all are intrinsically real. They have swabhava in that they have causal power. They have, they, they have the ability to do something and that is really what they're, existence consists of or is constituted by is the, this causal power that they have in and of themselves, not in and of themselves in that, you know, nothing produced them. They are, they are causally dependent upon um, their, you know, the, the, the conditions that gave rise to them. But they have uh, some intrinsic nature, some essence, loosely speaking, in that they have this, this thing that they're going to do uh, just by virtue of their existing. Now, and so Madhyamaka will come along and very roughly speaking, deny this that even this type of intrinsic nature is is, is acceptable in their analysis because um, once you so let's say you grant that okay they're causally dependent uh, but they have intrinsic nature still also there's some sense of conceptual dependence that like we cannot make sense of you know just as you can't uh, really say that someone is a son like a, a child with intrinsic nature because that notion. Uh, conceptually depends on, on there being a parent and that you can't be a parent unless you have children. So you can't be a parent with intrinsic nature. Um, but that's a conceptual dependence, right? A parent uh, qua just person can exist, you know, the person can exist without having children. They can't exist as a parent, but they can't exist, um, you know, we can't apply the concept to them. But physically, let's say, they'll exist with their own causal powers, um, and so on. So I wonder if you if you um, uh, would also like to uh, say that this notion of call, uh, of conceptual dependence, uh, which Madhyamaka thinkers put quite um, they they put quite quite a lot of weight on in 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 going that last extra step of saying everything is without swabhava, not just um, not just thing eternal things like the self or God, but that even uh, what other Buddhists thought to be intrinsically real and causally efficacious, momentary uh, physical entities, let's say. Even those are um, not ultimately real because not only are they causally dependent upon past uh, causes, uh, but that, you know, conceptually speaking, we, we can also find some sort of conceptual dependence uh, as well, and therefore they should be ruled out. So is there, um, in, in your seeing uh, Madhyamaka, in your recommending Madhyamaka anti-foundationalism, does this kind of conceptual or nominal dependence also uh, play a part? Yeah, um, I, I can answer specifically. Um, uh, not only, uh, the answer is yes. Um, and, and not only uh, I find this interesting, but that's the thing that I found it interesting. I mean, I, I was less ignorant that I pretended about uh, some aspect of Buddhist philosophy before reading the Gajuna. Uh, and uh, what I found uh, uh, remarkable is, uh, and relevant for quantum mechanics in Nagarjuna is exactly this, 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 uh, this further step that you, uh, that you say. That's what uh, I, I found is astonishing. And let me connect it to quantum mechanics specifically, because um, uh, one, one effort in trying to understand quantum mechanics is to sort of reduce it to um, elementary, uh, discrete, uh, separate, um, uh, manifestations uh, uh, like how it's called Dhamma in, uh, in uh, or something like that um, in, in the Buddhist tradition and uh, um, so you can take what what the uh, what the uh, um, uh, what the quantum mechanics are called the, the outcome of experiments which are the, 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 the single thing uh, forget about any reality in between them and and, and try to view quantum mechanics as description of the, the the, the, the ensemble of these things here. And quantum theory, uh, I, I don't want to go into the, in, in, into the technical detail of, about the problems with the division of quantum mechanics. Uh, 
uh, it just doesn't work. You have to view this, uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, it's called the flash ontology in, 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 in uh, uh, single events that make up reality as themselves um, relational to something else. And, and in, in quantum mechanics, they are simply relational to, uh, to, to a system with respect uh, with which they manifest themselves. Um, the point in Nagarjuna is much more, uh, uh, much more, uh, much, much wider. I mean, the, 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 uh, the lack of intrinsic existence is much wider. But then I found, so that's why somehow, but, but, but the gradual perspective allows me to do that. But then what he captured me is that uh, in his discussion about the views, Nagarjuna uh, takes the very representation of all that as dependent. And that's, I think, it's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the aspect that captured me uh, in, 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 uh, in that. It takes away a problem. It takes away a problem. And of course, one can, I mean, I know that there are some more sort of mystical ways of reading Nagarjuna, uh, which I profoundly respect and I don't. Uh, but from the specific uh, perspective of the physicist interest in quantum mechanics, uh, this is it. I mean, just get rid of the idea of this fundamental and elementary entity of realities uh, as the proper way of describing the universe. <clears throat> And uh, get rid of a notion of, I don't know, discreteness, either in, in whatever sure. that takes sure. place. Sure, yeah. sure. I mean, discreteness. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a defender of discreteness of space and time. In, uh, so <laughs> I made, made my career on discreteness of space and time. Mm -hmm. But, discrete, but you know, it's just conventional reality. That's not an absolute reality. OK. Right? So it's, uh, I know that this is made by atoms. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to debate strongly and uh, defend the idea that this is made by atoms. But I, Nagarjuna would be very happy with that. I mean, in, the, in, the, in the frame of conventional reality, I can reduce the spend to atoms in some sense. But first of all, I'm losing something. And second, this is not the ultimate reality of the pen. It's just part of the interdependence. It's, a, it's a, the aspect of the whole and the parts. Um, Good, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we could go on for a very long time, but we have to um, keep this a certain amount so that people are not extremely tired either. I'll try to answer and, and we, we can try may, to answer shortly. To may, maybe we should, uh, however, try to meet uh, one day somewhere, maybe in Dramsala, uh, hopefully. <laughs> um, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, who knows? So I would like to, this was a bit short. It would be nice if we would have more discussion with Amit and Julius, but maybe we'll wait for another time um, so that we can take a few questions from the audience. We have Andrea. Andrea, are you here? Yes. Can you unmute yourself? So Andrea had the task uh, to um, go through the questions and to select a few. Um, maybe let's try a couple to begin with and we see. Okay, hi, hi everybody. Um, thank you, Carlo and, and Barry for this, for this conversation, uh, this meeting of two different cultures in a way. Um, I, I tried my best to select the, the questions that seemed to me most on topic, relevant to this discussion and uh, that I could understand. And uh, maybe I will read them to you one by one. Um, so first, two questions at the beginning were about this idea of um, about re relations making up reality somehow. So no independent existence, but existence independently. And uh, Manu Srivastava uh, asked, why doesn't identity count as a relation? So a relation of an object with itself to give an object intrinsic existence. And this, I think, is a question interesting, both from the point of view of Buddhism and, and physics. Nagarjuna takes up that identity relation uh, actually extensively. And he makes some arguments that show a contradiction. For example, if something were identical with something else, excuse me, if something were identical with itself, 
that means that agent and object would have to be identical, which is a contradiction. Um, there are other contradictions of what he calls one and many. Um, for example, if we look at Barry and, and what makes up Barry, so-called five aggregates or the body and the mind, let's make it simple body and mind. If we uh, propose identity in that relationship between Barry and Barry's body and Barry's mind, uh, then there's a problem of one and many. There's one Barry, yet there's two things when we look at body and mind. So those are some of the um, recurring, lot that, that is some of the recurring logic that Nagarjuna uses to refute the relationship of identity. Uh, would somebody? Uh, yeah. I'm, yes. I, mean, I don't think identity, as far as I could tell, was really thought of as a relation that, um, uh, for, for in some, yeah, that for uh, just as Barry mentioned, right? If you're going to be, um, you know, so take a, a two place re relations were typically sort of understood as two place things in in Indian philosophy. So you have a causal relation, you have a cause, and in fact, you have an action. Uh, so you have an act uh, agent and an object. And so if the same thing were both a, uh, agent and object, that would uh, violate some basic uh, principle uh, in Indian grammar and in Indian philosophy or logic. Um, so I, yeah, I, I don't really uh, can't think of a place where identity was considered in relational terms. Uh, something, you know, something has an identity if it has intrinsic nature or so bhava. There are other words for it too. It's its own particular nature. Um, but yeah, it wasn't conceived of in relational terms. Um, I don't know about the history of Indian mathematics, whether that would uh, also be the case or not. Andrea, you can go on with the, I leave it to you, you can uh, take a couple of questions. We should finish in 10 minutes, uh, let's say six, 10. Okay, another question by uh, Johannes Kleiner was asking about um, the relevance of classical logic to reason about these things, about these topics. And in particular, uh, is, there, is there like a search for a justification for using classical logic to explore something about existence and non-existence? And uh, I, I wonder, I mean, just, I'm, I'm not an expert on non-classical logics, uh, I guess, Carlo, do you, so some people will read Nagarjuna as allowing for the existence of true contradictions, that something can be both true and false at the same time. And uh, Graham Priest is a philosopher who has a um, reading of Nagarjuna as under his uh, dialethist logic, which allows for certain uh, contradictions to be true. Um, I don't, I don't think that actually works in the case of, I think Nagarjuna seems to presume the principle of non, principle of non contradiction in order to run these kinds of reduction, reductio ad absurdum type arguments um, by drawing contradictions and incoherencies within a given um, concept under analysis and then showing how it leads to contradiction. So we should reject that concept. Um, uh, yeah, do you have any thoughts about, uh, about you know, quantum physics is, is, is sort of notorious for seeming to violate basic laws of, of logic, like say the law of non-contradiction or law of excluded middle or, uh, and so on. And so do you think that um, our conventional logic, you know, say, say classical logic is, uh, in, in, if, if there is no ultimate reality for Madhyamaka or for your, your understanding of uh, quantum physics slash Madhyamaka, um, then should the tools of uh, classical logic, what, what are the tools within conventional discourse, broadly speaking as well, for um, capturing um, what Madhyamaka is saying or what quantum physics, as you understand it, are saying? So yeah, let me answer <clears throat> specifically. Um, uh, Nagarjuna uh, main, Nagarjuna is, from one perspective, it can be viewed as a, as a logician, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, his way of presenting things. Uh, uh, it's it's a, a characteristic of somebody who's a, who's a logician who uses logic. 
Uh, but from from West's perspective, a first a first impact it sounds strange because uh, his main uh, tool is the tetra. It's called tetra, whatever. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah Trilemma, uh, uh, tetralemma, which um, somehow uh, presents uh, the impossibility of four alternatives. Uh, one being A, something, I don't know, time exists. Uh, one being non-A, say time does not exist. Uh, and the third being uh, um, neither A nor not A. <clears throat> and the fourth is uh, both A and non-A. So it seems, uh, wait a moment, uh, we, 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 are, we are talked in logic 101 um, that uh, uh, either A or not A and teratum non data, so the Aristotle um, beginning of logic. So it seems to be a clash here. Uh, my impression is that there's no clash, is that the known of non A is not the same known as, uh, um, as the Aristotelian known. And we can, uh, we can think of innumerable uh, everyday experience in which this four possibility is exactly what we would uh, uh, we would consider. So the, the exhaustive thing is the four this four possibility. I don't want to go technically specifically, but uh, so it's not a, an alternative logic here. It's just a different way of using known. Um, so I don't see any clash between what we call logic. Uh, in, 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 in. It's an interesting articulation, but not any, any, any clash. It's not an uh -huh. ad logic. Um, the same is true with quantum mechanics. Uh, people have been arguing that we can understand quantum mechanics by changing the logic. I find it, yeah, but I find it is not really particularly clarifying. Um, it's true. I mean, the, the particle doesn't go here nor goes there. So if we think of these are two alternatives, uh, quantum mechanics can be thought of, uh, can be phrased uh, as an alternative logic. But I, all the alternative logic that I found, they can be rephrased in terms of logic with different definitions. So I don't, I don't, I don't think that this is the point. Um, that's this is this is the answer to, to your to your question about logic. You know the. Uh... Mula Madhyamaka Karika, his main treatise, which we're talking about, Nagarjuna's text. Um, it's very short, as you mentioned, Carlos. Um, and some of the things that are not there and that are not written that are implied and also to make it such a difficult text to understand is that he's refuting many different schools yeah. of understanding an essence in reality. And so when he does the tetralemma, one of the usages is to be complete in terms of all the different you know, traditions or schools that are claiming some essence in reality to refute them. And some do say that there's nothing, you know, not the neither alternative. And some say things do exist and do not exist, the both. So I think he's using that more pedagogically, if you will, to, um, to refute all possible understandings of an intrinsic existence and that's some of the beauty of, of his work and it's some of the difficulty in understanding it because you know unless you're really well read and really understand fully all the different positions uh you it's hard to really know what he's doing at any one time um i could comment on this because it could be interesting um so there is this uh, sense in which Barry explained that uh, somehow answering to all possible counter arguments at the same time. And there's also a very simple way that you can see that this is not really about a different logic. So take the double slit experiment in quantum mechanics. What's the point there that you try to explain a certain set of experimental data by saying, where does the particle go? Does it go through slit A? Does it go through slit B? Does it go through both? Does it not go to neither? And none of these four possibilities explains what you're seeing on the screen. So what do you do there? It's not that uh, you've reached a conclusion that everything is wrong, is that you uh, throw away the presupposition. What was the presupposition? That the particle is somewhere. Uh, so this is straightforward use of logic, it seems to me, that uh, I don't see any yeah. weird logic going on there. Exactly. You also throw away the, the notion of a particle then, if particles are that which have to be somewhere? No, you throw away the notion that it's an intrinsic reality. Right. The particle it, is an intrinsic that's, reality. That's what Nagarjuna does, right? If you continue doing that, then you throw away everything. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with uh, 
personally, if you ask me, I agree that there is no intrinsic reality. Um, yeah. In the sense that whenever you assume such a thing, you're going to fall into contradictions. I have a, another question, perhaps for Carlo. Um, could you do you think that um, could you say a bit more about like how uh, how you view this um, uh, lingering insistence on intrinsic reality or intrinsic nature in contemporary physics? Uh, like how how do you see it sort of inhibiting or how, you know either historically or even in in uh, in contemporary times, inhibiting current scientific progress on a given um, uh, subject. Do you think like it has, you know, uh, uh, you, can, you can pinpoint specific places where it, we actually need to uh, abandon this presupposition in order to make progress on a given scientific problem? Or is it sort of a general, um, uh, sort of general obstacle? Or like, or it's more, we, we get a more elegant uh, theory of physics if we abandon it, but. Uh, or is there something like specific? Yeah. Well, historically, realism has played both roles in science. I mean, as a, a an obstacle to go ahead. Uh, I mean, from antiquity, the, the crystal sphere, uh, the particles that made so difficult to accept the Maxwell equations as, as they are, uh, and, uh, and and others. Uh, uh, but also has played a very useful role. Somehow. Hanging on to the to the notion, well, what is the real stuff there has been very productive. I mean, think about uh, kinetic theory of gases, for instance. So it's 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 a balance, right? It's not it's not useful to say, oh, okay, get rid of your reality and study it better. I mean, no. I mean, like, it's, it's, but that's 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 a way the science promises. Of course, we would like to be <clears throat> um, super open to all possibilities, but we live within a conceptual structure. We cannot go out, we cannot cancel it because then we're silent, which is fine if we just want to meditate, but not if we want to do physics. We're using, uh, we're using a conceptual structure. So I think the, the, the issue is the issue of balance. Um, I think that. Uh, specifically in the interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, um, exactly in the same sense in which, uh, uh, you know, Einstein got clarity about the, 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 the Lorentz transformation and these funny things about, uh, about the speed of light uh, by just pointing out the wrong uh, uh, assumption about reality, which, you know, simultaneity, it's, it's well defined. Uh, here, the, um, uh, the existing of an ontological state of things um, between two uh, relative events is what, um, it, it's a wrong conceptual assumption. So there's a certain specific notion of reality that it's, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that, it, that it's, it, it's preventing us for, for digesting quantum mechanics better. Um, this is not the whole, Nagajuna criticism about ultimate reality, of course. Um, it, it's a very specific uh, partial uh, use of it. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it, it, it plays a crucial role. I, you know, I, in, in my work on quantum gravity, I, 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 and I wrote a lot about that, uh, the notion of time as a primary and essentially fundamental aspect of the world, the passing time, it's another. I think a lot of people are blocked on the idea that, oh, it's impossible to think about the world uh, unless I think about some objectively existing time flowing and the past being different from the future, which is what Barry mentioned in one of his uh, last comments. Um, once again, there, I, I find it wonderful and surprising that I, I need to do quantum gravity and to get rid of this distinction from past and future. And uh, there is a tradition of thinking that says, look, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, uh, and it's compatible with our everyday view of reality. It's not against our everyday view of reality. So these are the two of the, of the key aspects. Whether we do have other metaphysical assumptions uh, uh, that are wrong in thinking, in doing science, uh, of course, yes, but who knows? I mean, maybe future. I, I don't think we can, we can start from there. We, we should start from you know, experiments, what goes wrong, and what, when, when we're in trouble, we say, well, maybe there's something wrong in our way of thinking. I have a, another follow-up, a more broad follow-up. I don't know. I, I don't want to monopolize um, the discussion, but uh, maybe Andrea has other questions. Or... Yeah, by all means. Let's take one more question, maybe from Andrea. 
I think we should, uh, yeah, this discussion has to continue, but we should wrap up uh, pretty soon. Okay, so um, it's hard to choose. Um, so there is a question about, so now we argued about um, reality being relational. And so somebody is asking, David, David Sale is asking, uh, what is the relevance or perhaps the application of the concept of not one true reality in the context of people trying to come to agreement on various different issues? So I guess it's... Here. In, in, in science? Well, the question is quite... Uh, Can you quite, repeat, quite scope, Andrea? So I guess. Yeah, sorry, did I, did, I, did I cut? So the question was, what is the relevance or better yet, the application of the concept of no one true reality in the context of people trying to come to agreement on various issues? Well, I would say the interpretation of quantum mechanics is the big discussion. It's a huge discussion, which is open and very, very alive, both in physics department and in philosophy departments. And uh, uh, within that specific discussion, which I, which I think is crucial for the advancement of science, we have to get more clarity about quantum mechanics to do quantum gravity, to do other things, and, and, and by itself. Um, and that's the notion of what we mean by real. It's, a, it's, a, it's relevant, it seems to me. So I think the question was in the context of our polarized world where people don't talk to each other because they have different views. You know, they believe there's one true reality. Um, and so, you know, if we can understand that there is no one true reality, that everything is relative, that, um, you know, we base our conclusions on what's real uh, from the information that comes in. Uh, you know, if you watch certain news, you get a certain perspective on what's real. If you watch other news, you get a different perspective on what's real. So understanding that, that um, our, our notion of what's real is very much informed by kind of what comes in. And if we don't have other things coming in, we're gonna have one view of a true reality. If we have other things coming in. So just knowing that, you know, if the heart and the mind are even a little bit open, you recognize that it's all quite relative, that it certainly depends on, you know, previous information, input, et cetera. So therefore there is no one true reality and therefore, you know, if you were to even go in that direction, it would be love, it would be compassion, it would be kindness. And so that people could actually sit down, even with differences, but have respect for each other in, the spite, in spite of differences. And that would begin to change this very polarized world where we have so much us and them and hate and violence. Um, and, you know, it, it's important to return to what's common and what's common is that we all want to be happy and none of us want to hurt. You know, it's love, it's compassion. And so when we return to that, you know, the notion and getting stuck in one reality and I'm right, you're wrong, begins to fade away. And so it's very important that that be put into our education system throughout the world, starting with kindergarten up. And there are school districts in some countries that are beginning to do that. Um, and uh, I think it's really crucial for our survival as a you know, civil society. Can I make a comment here, uh, Marius, to, 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 to what Barry said? I, 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 I fully agree. Um, I, I think people resist to that because people are afraid that uh, um, uh, taking this, this, this position too strongly allows um, uh, wrong thing, too, too, too many wrong things to be, and, 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 and loses any notion of uh, any possibility of us discussing and coming to an agreement about things. And I think it, it doesn't. So I think recognizing the difference of point of view doesn't mean uh, that uh, we should not, or we do not have the possibility of comparing our views and learning from one another and getting to a mutual understanding and a better uh, a step ahead. In other words, um, I'm, I'm happy to respect people who have views different from mine, but I also want them to tell me why I think I'm wrong and be able to tell them why I think they're wrong. And I am confident that more often than not, this does bring us to, um, is, Historically, that's what's happened uh, constantly. And in fact, science is an incredible exercise of that, accepting a different perspective, uh, but then through discussion and through comparison, through dialectics somehow, um, uh, 
getting to 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 a, a a better point of view that allows us to uh, uh, to say, well, that was wrong, that was right, um, I was wrong, you were right, and so on, and 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 uh, and learning more. And if we can do that in the spirit that you are saying, that would be the best. Okay, um, I want to bring one last question, and then I would like to give you the chance to briefly comment in um, whatever you have to say to all four of you. So this question is from is from our director here at the Ecoki that Carla knows very well. I think it's addressed more to Carla, but I will try to explain it. Is there an operational way to distinguish between um, inherent reality and conventional? Reality. So, what the question is: Is there, uh, would there? Let's assume that this existed. This, um, you know, ultimate essence. Um, would there be any way to do an experiment and say, "Oh, that thing does not exist," but uh, the conventional reality exists? That's sort of the question. I think my I, I would answer you no. Could not, you could not do an experiment if things existed inherently and intrinsically, because there could be no relationship, no experimenter, no, re no experiment. Uh, things could not function at all. I think that's, yeah. Please, yeah, I would agree. sorry to interrupt. No, I would agree entirely. So I, my, I would say no. This is not the point. Right, you're both saying. So I, I didn't say the name, it was Chaslav Bruckner, right? So the- yeah, well <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the answer is no for both of you. Um, but, I will, but I would comment, there's no experiment that can check whether the Earth is the center of the universe or not. Nobody can think of the experiment that could ascertain whether the, the Earth is the center of the universe or not, right? It's a, it's a, and yet, I don't think anybody in their mind would think that this is a bad scientific question. It's a good scientific question that within science has a good answer which is the Earth is not the center of the universe, but it, it has a good answer not because we make an experiment. It has a good answer because uh, uh, the conceptual structure that we use by taking uh, the Earth not to be the center of the universe works far much better, allows us to understand more things. So science is not about uh, you know, what I can measure or not measure. It's also about how to think about things. That's why I think, uh, the, there are interesting questions inside, like is the Earth the center of the universe, which don't have a, a, a direct uh, way of checking them empirically. Um, science is more than just checking things empirically. Right. You know, I, I, we talked I, about I, we talked about the double slit experiment and the Schrodinger, you know, thought experiment, the, the cat Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. And those two could, to some extent, I think, operationalize the question of, you know, conventional versus ultimate existence, because they're showing some observer relativity. So they're, you know, refuting the notion of something being objective and independent. Um, so I think those could partially operationalize the distinction between conventional and ultimate reality. Yes. I'm or sure another way. If I may add something, another way of seeing it, the distinction between conventional and ultimate reality is conventional reality. And if I'm reading Nagarjuna correctly, and uh, the, the very distinction is very skillful means, uh, uh, when we're talking about ultimate reality, it's not something we can talk about. So everything that we are actually verbalizing is very much within conventional reality. There's no way to get there's no way that we could use verbalization or speech or conceptualization really to to discuss something that's beyond conceptualization beyond duality right i mean if that's my my take on it so it, it's a very interesting uh uh again i think i think we must heed to nagarjuna's uh warning that if we turn emptiness into a theory uh we are incurable there is no cure for anyone who will take these teachings, these insights, and turn them into a model of reality. Uh, there will be no cure for that person. And I think that's a very interesting comment that Nagarjuna makes. Uh, eight, chapter, yeah. chapter eight, 
to yeah. the, the views. Yeah, yeah I agree. Oh, that's, that, that's a very beautiful understanding. I, I would argue with one small yeah. point. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's a wonderful understanding um, from my perspective. We can talk about ultimate reality, but that's not rea ultimate reality. It is conventional reality. Just one fine thing difference there, uh, Georgios. Yes, thank you, Barry. That's you're refining it much better. Yes, I may be right, I may be wrong, but anyway, that's kind of from you know my perspective. Yeah. Is there any final comment by anyone? I, I personally found this uh, very interesting, and I think we could go on for hours. We're already at uh, two hours and fifteen minutes. It's a good point to stop and reflect and. I hope there is going to be something, uh, a follow up of this of some kind. Yes. I'm very Barry. grateful. I'm very grateful to Barry, to all of you. Thank you very much for this. I'm also very grateful to you, Carlo. It's been really wonderful to get to know you this way and exchange ideas this way. I've learned a lot. And Marios, thank you very much for moderating and coordinating all of this. And, and Georgios and Amit and Andrea for joining in. Uh, you know, adding your uh, expertise and your your brilliance, I think it you know rounds it out into a very beautiful discussion, and it it does need to be continued. I agree. Can the questions be saved on a file, Marius, so yes. you can get to read them? Okay, thank you. Yes, I wanted to say that that I'm sorry to everybody that has questions and we didn't take them, but I will send everything to uh, Carl and Barry, and if they have the time, they can get back to you. So thank you all for joining. Thank you very much. It was lovely. And hope to see you in some island again soon or yes, somewhere else. I hope, I hope you come to visit us, Mario, yes? I, I will uh, try. Yes. Or in that Dharamsala. We will see. Yes, yes you're, you're very welcome in Dharamsala. So take care, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. That bye. was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea, also for the questions. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.